this is a really important topic to me. Uh, it was uh, a few years ago, I suddenly realized that uh, even though I was a parish pastor of a church and at times several churches, the people I was always attracted to were the people who asked the hard questions. And sometimes those who said, yeah, I don't really think I can believe any of that. And, and I always kind of wondered, what, what is it about me that, that uh, drew me to those people? Um, and uh, in many ways, there was also a bit of a carrot and a stick here, because very often the people who said, I believe everything just the way God told it to us, turned out to be people I didn't quite like quite as well. <laughs> I, I hate to admit that, but, but it's true. I, I sort of wanted to surround myself with people who ask questions. And uh, I never could figure out the, the notion that only those who are part of my group, who believe just as I do, and, you know, given the, the, the vastness of the world and the vastness of all the very many people and their many beliefs down through the centuries, the, the uh, thousands upon thousands of gods and goddesses that people believed before, they, they, before Christianity came along. And then even today, the wonderful Christian and Muslim and Jewish people who I have known who I knew were godly people. And, and, and to put that all in the context and say, yeah, but they're not Seventh-day Adventists. They're not gonna be saved. I, I could never ever buy that. And yes, that did make it complicated at times to be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And I will candidly admit that. And so when I retired, I was finally able to wrestle with this a little bit and, uh, and did a little work on it. Now, I should say last week, I, I had, I, I think there were some misunderstandings from my group. I, I think some people thought I was there to either argue for or against the existence of God. That's not what I'm doing here. Um, I, I, I think some people thought I was perhaps being a bit more uh, uh, philosophical or uh, epistemological than I intend to be in this presentation. Uh, just take it for what it is and please understand, it's not a perfect picture that I'm presenting here. I, I'm, I'm doing my best to wrestle with something that I as a believer, a lifelong believer, found very difficult to wrestle with. And the fact that I'm in my 60s and still struggling with it uh, should, should, should tell you that. Um, so let me move on to, th this is a little, little page here that I called what I believe. Doubt, unbelief, rejecting simplistic answers, questioning the conventional wisdom. These are not bugs in the process, but essential features for honest seeking after God. Without doubts, we become stupid believers, mere conformists, failing to learn or even to comprehend the power and infinity of God to appreciate that God is so, knows so much more than, than we do. And I would say ultimately, we will find ourselves content with inferior moral thinking as well, which in, um, by moral thinking, I mean how we treat the people around us. So, uh, let me talk you to a little bit about unbelief. Now, most ancient peoples, going back as far as we know, believed in some god or gods. And I would say in this case, probably gods is more accurate than god. Um, I, I don't know for sure, but I am guessing that the first great monotheism to emerge on the scene probably was uh, the, the Hebrew monotheism. I, I, and even they weren't all that good at it, as, as we know from reading the Old Testament. They, they struggled. Um, 
monotheists, I, I, I found this, this wonderful quote from Yuval Noah Harari in the book Sapiens, which by the way, I recommend very highly. Monotheists have tended to be far more fanatical and missionary than polytheists. Now, this really struck me when I read this, uh, this next section, because I have always been told as, as a monotheist that our God knows and has everything, and we know everything that God knows, and uh, at least enough to, be, to go around and act like know-it-alls. A religion that recognizes the legitimacy of other faiths, and he's talking about polytheism here now, implies either that its God is not the supreme power of the universe, or that it received from God just part of the universal truth. Monotheists have been compelled to discredit all other religions. Over the last two millennia, monotheists repeatedly tried to strengthen their hand by violently exterminating all the competition. It worked. And then he goes on to give some examples of ways in which monotheism uh, was violently and excludingly opposed to other people of other belief systems. Now, as far as, uh, as, as far as actual agnosticism or atheism goes, I, I think the closest we come to that in the Old Testament is Ecclesiastes. And uh, sorry about the, the misspelling there. Uh, the, there. There was some admission of, of at least a deep cynicism there. And, and, and I've often said that Ecclesiastes wouldn't have survived if, any, if anybody really read it carefully and, uh, and, and realized what it was actually saying and didn't try to make excuses for it. Somebody would, be, would have been sure to have snatched it out of the, the Bible by now. Uh, we, we also have some Eastern religions and some African religions, uh, very few African religions, actually. Uh, the, uh, Harari and others have mentioned that there were some tribes that uh, gave no credence to any spirits anywhere. But uh, there are, we, we call Hinduism and Buddhism non-theistic religions. It doesn't mean they're not religions. They, they, they have uh, some sort of metaphysics behind them, but they are not theistic in the sense that the Abrahamic religions are. And then we go a little bit farther and we have uh, some of the uh, doubters that in our own uh, two millennia, uh, Voltaire was of course, uh, sort of a famous uh, atheist, but the person who really, I think, turned the corner for us. Now, I should point out that Darwin did not set out to destroy belief in God. He actually, at one point, had considered studying, studying ministry uh, briefly uh, before he was able to break into the, to the sciences. Uh, but it was Darwin that made it possible for people to say, well, we don't need a God in order to make the universe work. And uh, that was uh, the, the turning point the, the, of, uh, toward agnosticism, well, I should say atheism, actually. Um, but let me talk, first of all, about agnosticism. The word agnostic means unable to know. And that describes more than just those who call themselves unbelievers. By definition, faith is not knowing for sure. If you knew, you wouldn't need faith. It would be knowledge. So all of us are agnostic. Now, let me make a distinction here that my friend David Geelan has made, and that is he, he draws a line between soft agnosticism, which is what I'm acknowledging here. This is soft agnosticism. I'm saying that I can believe but not know for sure. He has another category that he calls hard agnosticism, which is to say, uh, I can't know for sure, and therefore I am not going to, to, to believe. And uh, that's a slightly different thing, but I still just want to acknowledge the fact that all of us are in some ways agnostics. We do not know for sure. If we knew for sure, uh, we, we would uh, be a lot probably easier 
in, uh, in, in our minds about the existence of God and what happens afterwards in the afterlife. Uh, but, but we do not know for sure. Uh, without, but but I, I'm taking the next step here to say that we need, we require unbelief and doubt. And this is a, a quote from my essay. I submit for your consideration that doubt is a valuable quality, one that Christianity would be impossible without. Doubt is a function of asking good questions, of studying and analyzing, of having an open mind, in short, for having the courage to think things over carefully. Do we value an open mind? We should. It's what allowed Abraham to leave paganism and become a follower of Yahweh. It let the apostles set aside Judaism for Christianity. It's what the pioneers of our own church had when they crafted the teachings that led to the creation of the Seventh Baptist Church. The present truth we haven't just proclaimed meant that someone had doubted what they'd previously been told. Even today, all of the best scholars make progress only because they question the conventional wisdom. There can be no accepting of new ideas without questioning, that is doubting, old ones. Of all the people I know who are connected to Adventism, whether they are still fully, whether they still fully believe or not, the ones I most respect are those who had the courage to say, let's take another look at that. And so the question I, I ask here is, do we still possess that eagerness for and openness to discovery? And if not, why have our mental arteries hardened? And uh, this, this statement probably I, I may, may go too far for you, but I think it's an important one. Far from the need to fully commit to stand for every doctrine, though the heavens fall, it is time for us to value not fully committing to everything we hear, lest we commit to what turns out to be nonsense. And I can tell you folks right now, I'm, I'm very concerned about a, a lot of people here in America and a lot of people in my own church, because a lot of people have committed to things that will eventually turn, they, they appear to be nonsense now, and they will eventually look like even worse nonsense, such as a few Seventh Baptist evangelists who are speaking against vaccines, for example or are uh, idolizing Donald Trump, uh, these, uh, these will turn out to be nonsense ultimately. Uh, we need to not commit to everything we hear. And, I, and I've even raised the question whether some of the things we are committed to like Sunday laws or, or uh, how evil the papacy are, whether these are in fact things that have already proven to be nonsense because we haven't seen any of these things actually uh, happening and taking place in the world that we live in. So back to faith, what is faith? Faith is not proof. Uh, I had a church member one time when uh, we, we were in a Sabbath school class and, and uh, somebody said, why do you believe what you, you believe? And he said, well, to me, it's that, that uh, 69 and 70 week prophecy. He says, you can work that out and then go halfway through the, la the last week, the sacrifices cease and starts with the, the, the you work out the algebra and it starts with the, uh, the, the beginning of Jesus ministry and then the going forth of, the, uh, of the, the message to the Gentiles and halfway through that time, Jesus is sacrificed. He says, those, those numbers couldn't work out unless the Bible was absolutely true, and that means there is also a God. So for him, that's how he worked it out, and he could say, I, I believe everything is true because of that. A lot of people also say, I believe in God because of creation. And as I said before, that, that worked for a, a long time. It, it, it worked until we got to the point where it began to be apparent that there may be other ways for the universe to have come into being. And people started explaining it in those ways. And then we have a lot of people who are in a real crisis right now uh, in our church on the, on the matter of origins. Um, I'm not gonna get into that. It's not really my, 
my area and I, and I, I don't really, haven't really studied creation and evolution and those sort of things. And for, for reasons I, I can't explain, it's not really something that's ever really bothered me a great deal. Uh, and so I've never spent a lot of time at it, but I'm just saying it, it does seem to be a, a, a very strong theme right now. Uh, faith is a personal experience or conviction, or sometimes even praxis without belief. And uh, if you want me to explain that last line, I will. But here is uh, something that I had written. People in the Bible said they had direct knowledge of God. And some today still claim that, saying they've experienced miracles or have talked to God. But this is highly individualized evidence, generally inferred rather than proven. That doesn't mean they're wrong. It just means that they believe it and act on it. And it's that act on it that, that I'm talking about when I say praxis without belief. I, I, I really do think if somebody believes something, it's what they act upon, not just what they mentally assent to. It just means that they believe it and act on it without proof they can show to the rest of us. We who gather in churches do so to share such convictions and experiences and to be strengthened by one another. But we still accept our shared experiences by faith, not scientific proof. I'm just going to add one little thing here, and it, it may prompt some conversation somewhere along the line. It's a, a, a it's just slightly off the, the track, but that is, I believe that faith is rarely best described in terms of orthodoxy or cradle statements. I, I think we have to take another look at this whole matter of what it means to believe. I, I'm, I'm struggling with that. I'm working on that right now. I, you know, it's something I'd like to talk with, with some of you about a little bit more. What we can't know. God is infinite and we are by definition highly limited. Let's just, let's just own up to this. And I am so tired of people, people telling me, I know everything that I need to know about God. No, you do not. Uh, don't, don't be ridiculous. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Who did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? I mean, that. The, the absolute arrogance of some Christians to claim what they that, that they know about God. I, I've actually heard people say to me, uh, my God and I know that this is true. <laughs> it's just like, makes me want to pull my hair out. My God and I, you know, God and I have decided on this. And so that whatever you think is completely discredited because my God and I have figured it out. How in search of all are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I take that very seriously. I don't think there's a great deal about God that, that I can know beyond what God wants me to know. For who hath known the mind of the Lord in 1 Corinthians? These passages confirm that all we know of God are some human graspable metaphors. So the details of what you and I think we know about God may simply not prove to be true or are true only in some schematic or abstract form? And you say, well, is it enough to have a schematic or an abstract understanding of something? And I will say again, the main teaching of the New Testament is not that you earn salvation by knowing everything there is about God, but because God gifts it to you through grace, not by your knowledge. And so the arrogance of, of Theologians, uh, Dr. Turney, forgive me, the, but the arrogance of theologians just sometimes drives me crazy. I, 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 I'm not saying we shouldn't study, but I'm saying there's got to be a great deal of humility that goes into this. Where I place my faith. Now, I put this, th this passage in here because it's been quoted by others, and uh, a, a lot of people wrote me notes after this magazine came out and said, this is the passage that really struck me. The one thing, the most important thing I have faith in is that God is good. That God is neither unreasonable nor selfish. That God's understanding of us is far above our understanding of ourselves, of one another, or of the world we live in. 
that God is neither petulant nor cruel, that God doesn't double speak or hide intentions or make us figure out things with algebra in order to be saved, that God doesn't base our salvation on things like food or jewelry or on which human organiz organization records our names on its books, and that above all, above all, God understands our difficulty to believe in God's self. Uh, there are many reasons. This came from a story that I, I, I have a, a, a lovely dear friend who's about, I don't know, he's well into his 80s at this point. And uh, he, he, he certainly came to his faith in a very traditional mode, and he loves eschatology and all of these sorts of things. Uh, and, and just, but, you know, someone that I consider a deeply godly man even though he and I don't have the same definition of what it means to be, to be a person of faith. Uh, and he said to me one day, he said, you know, Lauren, my, uh, my son, I've got a wonderful son. He said, he's a good man, takes care of his family, kind, uh, volunteers in his community, um, very kind to me and his mother. Uh, and he said, it's just sad. One day he announced to me, and here I am, you know, a pastor in the church, and my son announces to me that he's an atheist. And he said, my goodness, I've had to struggle with that and finally came to the realization that uh, I'm not going to have the chance to spend eternity with my son. And I found that so unbearably sad. I, I simply don't believe it. I, I tried to convince him otherwise, but but he was pretty determined that uh, he, the, the path to God, even though it might not be as narrow as some thinks, it, some think it was not broad enough to allow an atheist to to be in eternity with him. But I, I tried to make this argument that there are many reasons why one may not may reject or or simply not be able to grasp. A traditional belief in God. Uh, his son, for example, is a scientist and uh, an analytical thinker who can't score the claims of science with the claims of the Bible. I understand that. Don't you think God should? Uh, perhaps he was given a picture of a God who he can't accept, uh, a wrong picture of God, a picture of a cruel and petulant God, as I described in the last passage and is unable to see God differently. Maybe he was exposed to the spiritual manipulation that is so common in religion, and he just rejected the whole, the whole business. Uh, sensitivity to the sin and suffering of the world. I've met many people who just say, I cannot look at the world with all this sin and suffering and war and disease and you know, millions of people wiped out, and I cannot discern that there is a benevolent deity behind it. I understand that when they tell that to me. Don't you think God understands that too? Or perhaps a non-affective emotional makeup. Uh, there, there are people whose belief in God is based on, on, a, on a deep feeling, a deep conviction uh, that they really can feel. I am more of an analytical person myself. I don't really get that sense of an invisible presence uh, which, with whom I have a relationship very well. My, my, as, I, as I said in the piece, my belief in God is idiosyncratic, and I think most people's is, if you really want to analyze it. I have to believe, if I'm to believe in God at all, that uh, God understands and takes into account all of that. After all, if you and I can understand why people are as they are, why can't God? Why would God throw under the bus a completely honest, searching good man who, because of experiences and personality traits outside of his control, can't accept the kind of God that is meaningful to you and me? Now, I am coming to the end here. And uh, so this is the time if you are raising hands and uh, you want to... Uh, stone me over the internet somehow. I don't know how you're going to do that or throw rotten tomatoes at me. This is the time to, to start getting ready for that. Um, what this isn't, uh, 
somebody who read an early version of this article said, well, yeah, you make a good point. He said, uh, unless we can't hang out with believer, unless we hang out with unbelievers, we can't hook them back into being believers again. Uh, because when they see how, how, how accepting and how kind and how good you are, then they're going to become believers like you. And, and I said, no, that's not what I'm doing. I mean, may, maybe that's, uh, there isn't, it is true, of course. We, we tend to hang out in our own little clubs and, and, and we don't really talk to unbelievers. We, we push them away if we discern them. But that's not what I'm doing. I do not bury a barbed hook in my friendships. Uh, first, I respect my unbelieving friends too much to do that. If you've ever been invited to someone's house thinking that you're making friends and then they hit you up to sell Amway, you realize there's nothing less winsome than hidden motives. Second, if you've gone far enough in your spiritual journey to make a decision not to be part of a church, then my evangelistic urging probably isn't going to help. So unbelievers, you're safe from a scheming Lauren. I don't know if you're safe from God, but that's your lookout, not mine. So I'm going to throw out some questions here. I'm going to go ahead and read through these. And, and I wish uh, the, these questions are particularly important to me. I mean, I, I, I struggled with them as I made them. It's not that you guys have to answer them, but you might want to copy them down or take a screenshot or something right now. Uh, questions to ponder. And this first one strikes me especially hard. How important is belief? Has belief been overemphasized? Uh, and all, all of our lives, we've said, uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Or uh, God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him will not perish. And so these two texts have been kind of pulled out of, of the background, it seems to me. And uh, everything else in the New Testament that seems to indicate that uh, God is faithful even to unbelievers uh, doesn't seem to rise to the top. Here's what bothers me about belief. And I hope some of you will, will think about this a little bit. What bothered me about belief is it makes it my responsibility rather than God's responsibility. I somehow have to drum up enough belief in me, you know, that I remember a pastor telling a story in a sermon one time about how the, the, all the farmers were getting together to pray for rain and one little girl brought her umbrella along to church as they were praying for rain. And what a marvelous example of faith. She had belief that God would do that. And so that somehow becomes sort of a magic thing. And the same thing is true of salvation. If I, if I could just believe hard enough that God is going to be faithful to me. I, I just want us to, to question that a little bit. Is belief more important than practice? Can we practice godliness without believing in God? Uh, that's, you know, think about that one. Uh, I have I have several friends who are not traditional believers who are truly godly people who I would trust with anything in my life. Is there a relationship between the disdain of agnostics, atheists, and others, and the goals and purposes of organized religion? Hmm. Uh, I, I'd say probably, but I, I'd like to hear what you guys think. What responsibility, if any, do we have to make unbelievers or doubters into believers? And how far do we go to do that? Uh, do we go as far as the Muslims who stormed Northern Africa and put people to the sword if they refuse to confess a belief in Allah? You know, that's one extreme and one end. Um, I have participated, as some of you have, in evangelistic series where I felt like the um, the methods used to convince people to become believers probably bordered on the unethical. Um, those of you who have been very much plunged into the midst of 
of uh, evangelistic series where you're kind of twisting people's arms. You, you'll know what I'm talking about. Can people be saved without professing belief in God? What does the Bible mean when it says there is no other name under heaven given among humankind by which we can be saved? How do we find a balance between apologetics, the defense of the faith, and discovery, understanding new things and being open to new things? And finally, this was, I think, probably one of the most critical statements I made about the Seventh Adventist Church in this essay. And you are welcome to agree or disagree. We are now merely apologists for a 19th century message, large chunks of which are anything but present truth. This has made us Adventists not smarter, not thinkers at the cutting edge of faith and culture as we might once have been, but dangerously gullible. Um, that is the last, that, that is my last slide, uh, Gina. And uh, so I'll, I'll leave this up for just a moment. So if any of you want to take a screenshot or you want to jot down any of these ideas that you want to challenge me on, uh, I'm, I'm ready for that.